Okay, can I just hear from someone that you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you okay, but you kind of sound a little slow. A little slow? To me. Okay. But I'm on the other part of the world, so. <laughs> Okay. Does everybody hear me slow or? Okay, let, let me start. And if, if you guys don't hear me well, let me know. It is. This is looking at the sky from up on top of Sotmas. Wait, your thought was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so welcome everybody. Today our tour is gonna be really close to home. <laughs> beneath we grow, beneath the leaf of campus. I hope that uh, it can bring back good memories to, uh, to all of you, to some of you. Here we are in front of Mount Mount. Uh, the music you're hearing, I hope you're hearing, is by uh, Rabbi Kessel Scadlin on his uh, Native American flute. Okay, so on the start, I was giving everybody a little bit of a background to um, our city, our city spot. So we all know that there are cities in the land of Israel that are considered to be holy cities for the Jewish people. Jerusalem, Sfat, Chizmon, and Tiberias. And since Sfat is the city of the, of the Kabbalists, then we're going to say that um, according to the Kabbalah, the whole world is divided into four different elements. Kids, can you tell me what are the four elements? Let's see if I can see you. Okay, so the four elements are fire, water, earth, and wind. Okay, can you hear me? Can I get one more like thumbs up if you hear me okay? Because Alan says you can't hear me, right? Make a sign if you hear me. We can hear you, but you're garbled, and the music in the background doesn't sound like music. It sounds mm -hmm. like, you know, like you're in a tunnel, kind of. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, let's close the music. Um, should, I, should we try with this microphone, just with the computer's microphone, maybe? Yeah. Okay, we, we're going to give a chance to one different microphone here. Okay, how about this? Is this better? Better now? Yeah, well, keep, keep speaking. <laughs> okay. Um, Jerusalem, City of Fire. Yeah, uh, now, can you hear me well? No, Mother can't hear me well. Everybody says no. Hmm. He did this. Oh, oh that looks good. What about now? You can hear us well? Yeah. Yeah. Continue. Speak louder. Speak louder. Okay. I'm going to try to speak a little louder. Let's try this once again. So, uh, if anybody noticed the tension in Jerusalem in the last couple thousands of years, that is the fire of Jerusalem. This is what happens when you live on the heartbeat of the world. 
Yeah, can you hear me? Nav. We want to check it. <laughs> we, we, we hear you. We hear you. It's just a bad connection. Yeah. I wonder why. Why? What should we do? Uh, okay, I want you as well. Uh, should, I, should I come down to your house, maybe? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. We're going to try this from Alan's computer. Give us two minutes to get there. You, you want us to go down? Go down. 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 Go No, you fuck. No, it's not good. It's not good, you fuck. Well, I don't understand why you you can't do it here. And shall you just do the the screen? Okay, so I'm gonna speak from. You come here, you fuck, and let's just do the screen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's better. Okay, it's yours. Okay, I apologize for all of this. Is everyone here now? Okay, now it's okay. Okay, okay. even better. Now I get to be here with Fallon. <laughs> he taught me everything I know. Okay, so from the beginning, hello everybody. My name is Ifat. For those who don't 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 know me, um. I came to leave not for the first time almost 20 years ago doing my national service. And since they since then I, I sticked around pretty much. Um, and I'm one of the educators at Leave Note. It's a big privilege. And today our tour is gonna be in a beautiful national heritage site from the golden era of Tzfat in the 16th century that just happened to be right beneath the Leave Note campus. It was dug out in the last uh, 20 years. And we're gonna start from the balcony that I hope is uh, bringing everybody a lot of sweet memories of Kabbalah Shabbat and other magical moments. So here we are on the Leave Note balcony. And I started uh, saying before that for us, for the Jewish people, we have four cities in the land of Israel that are considered to be holy cities for the Jewish people, which are Yerushalayim, Tzfat, Hebron, and Tveria. These four cities, they parallel so perfectly with the four elements that the, the Kabbalistic teachings are talking about as the elements that create our, our entire world. Fire, water, earth, and wind. Okay, so if anybody noticed, there is uh, some tension in Jerusalem. Okay, there's there were a lot of wars in Jerusalem. Even when there are protests in Jerusalem, they tend to be very, very fiery. Okay, and that is because Jerusalem is like a heart to the world. If you if you're living in Jerusalem, it's like living on the heartbeat of of the world. So there's like you know that's intense. Um, but fire doesn't need to be destructive fire. Fire can be fire of love, fire of passion, of connection. And then the Jewish dream, one day the whole world is going to unite. Um, and the heaven and the earth are going to unite. So the heart of the world has the potential to bring everybody together. And that is the fire of Jerusalem. Then we have Tiberias, which stands for water, of course, with the Sea of Galilee. We have Hebron which stands for earth. It's the first piece of earth Abraham ever got in the land of Israel. And that's where our forefathers and mothers are buried, right? Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, and Leah are all 
buried in Hebron, and the people that live in Hebron, by the way, it doesn't matter if they're Jewish or Arab, um, but they're super connected to the earth. It's a very, very earthy place. And well, we have our um, hometown, Tzfat, which is the city of Ruach. Ruach in Hebrew means wind, but it also means spirit, okay? If you ever uh, was singing Shabbos songs on the Leave Not campus, but you are kind of like, and like claim about it, like you didn't really give it everything you have, then maybe Aaron came in and said, right? Where is your spirit? So because the Jewish people, we're a very spiritual uh, people, we actually have a few names for, for soul, um, for our, our consciousness in the Ruach is one of our names that we have for soul, for that special uh, human godly consciousness in, in Ruach is one of these names. So Tzfat has been known to be this capital for Jewish spirituality, for the more mystical part of the Torah. And now when did it all start? It's almost like hard to say. But if you're going to look with me, Shai, can you like point out Mount Meron? Yes, that mountain that looks like a camelback, exactly. Okay, so right there at the bottom, okay, right there on the top, yeah, there's an air force there, but don't tell anybody. That's our little secret. And then on the other side, on the bottom, that's where uh, uh, the Yeshuv Meron is. And that's where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried. Should we give her the what? Should we give her the, the screen so you could see the people? No, it was okay. okay, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai um, is known to this very day as probably the biggest masters of the Kabbalistic teachings. Although in, in, it's, there's something special in the Hebrew language, we, we don't have a word for master because we believe that we are um, on our way to infinity, right? So could you ever master infinity? Probably not, right? So we say Talmid Chacha, a wise student, right? But anyway, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he lived around this area about 2000 years ago, and he is the main teacher of a book named Sefer Zohar, which is the main, main, main teachings of the Kabbalah. And that alone, just the fact that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried there, was a good enough reason to turn Tzfat to what Tzfat is today. Um, since a lot of people were attracted to come to that place, uh, following the footsteps of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And once a year, there's the biggest Jewish gathering in the world where half a million Jews gather in that tiny little village trying to connect to the figure and the teachings of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And fortunately, you probably know that last year it ended up with a very big tragedy um, since uh, due to COVID and the attempt that was never done before to, to control the amount of people. And I guess the ways were not open as they usually were. So it wasn't flowing same way and uh, it created a very very dangerous situation and people fell uh, and the people were, that were behind them were not able to stop themselves there were so many people and 45 people were actually trampled to death it was a very very uh, traumatic experience so that's going to probably change the way we we celebrate uh, Omer from now on but if we go back to the, the character of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, I want to I share with you one little teaching by him before we're going to kind of like go underground uh, to the archaeological site. So there's a story that um, the Romans wanted to, uh, to put Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they wanted to put him to death because of uh, he wasn't a big fan of uh, the Roman Empire and the culture that they brought to Israel to say the least. Uh, and everyone didn't like it, so they wanted him dead. So he had to run away, and the story goes that he was hiding in a cave with his son, Rabbi Eliezer, and for 12 years, they did nothing but diving into the deepest, deepest, deepest teachings of the Kabbalah. 
um, kind of like imagine them like meditating alone in this cave, being so disconnected to, to our world of doing, only eating carobs, only drinking water from a spring. And uh, according to tradition, learning the secrets of the Torah from Elijah the prophet. Anyway, when they come out, they are so disconnected from the world of doing that um, the story goes that everywhere that they, they see people that just like, you know, they're trying to make a living. They're, they're working the, the earth. They're trying to grow things. And they're like, what are they doing? Why are they, um, instead of focusing on, on you know, the, what's eternal, they are wasting their time on like this passing world. Like, what is this? And it says that every place that they looked at turned on fire like they, they were burning the world with their with their sight with their eyes now we don't necessarily need to take this on a literal sense it's like when someone is looking at you and you feel unappreciated you know you feel this person is like burning me with his eyes he's judging me in a very very harsh way I feel very unworthy I feel like this person is, is, is burning me out, okay? This was the type um, uh, of, of, of look that they had when they came out to the world. And the story goes that a voice came out of the heavens and said, did you guys step out of your cave to destroy my world? If so, go back into your cave. So they did. And they went back to the cave for another whole year. That's the 13th year. And in Hebrew, the numerical number of, um, of the word love in echad, echad means one, equals 13. So I guess in that year, they learned to reconnect um, all those spiritual heights to our world, right? And when they came out of the key for the second time, they had a very, very different way of looking at the world and instead of like burning it they were um they were healing it and i think the story has a very um deep message for us um if we're talking about the right connection we should have in judaism between body and soul between physicality and spirituality right we're not supposed to um ascend to this like spiritual place where the physical world doesn't matter anymore but the opposite um the higher we go um the more precious that this world with its people should be for us we should just be more compassionate and more connected and more loving and more seeing the good and the beauty to be able to connect to all of that to the deepest secrets of the torah Anyway, so that's a little bit about the character of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, I'm going to say one more thing about the 16th century before we go down, since um, our site goes all the way back to the 16th century. So 16th century of Tzfat was basically after the Jews were expelled out of Spain, and most of them continued to nomad in different parts of the world. But about 10,000 Jews decided that enough is enough, right? After the Inquisition and all that Hara, Hara, yeah, that they went through um, in exile and they decided to come back to the one place that a Jew can really call it home and they decided to come back to the land of Israel. And you might say that this was the most significant immigration, the most significant aliyah um, the Jews um, did since the destruction of the second temple. Okay, so the Romans kicked us out of our land, destroyed our temple. And 1,500 years later, 10,000 Jews from Spain are making it to the land of Israel, and they settle here in Tzfat. Okay, they settle in Tzfat, first of all, because Tzfat, uh, Jerusalem was not really an option for them, but also because they had, um, uh, they, they knew how to, to make textile from wool, and they needed a river for this factory. And here in Tzfat, we have Nachal Amud, that I'm sure... A lot of you remember uh, hiking through that little piece of heaven that we have uh, right beneath our mountain. Today, it might seem to you like a small river, but that just because a lot of the water is being pumped out, it's actually a, 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 a nice river uh, when you just let all the water flow. So 
Tzfat of the 16th century was kind of like the Tel Aviv and the Jerusalem of today. It was flourishing both financially, but then also spiritually. The Kabbalists, the biggest um, um, masters of Kabbalah, somehow made it from different parts of the world to Tzfat in that time. And so, and they lived, they left a huge um, mark um, on the Judaism that we all know today. So many um, beautiful songs, poetry, traditions, a whole outlook really was developed here in Tzfat, such as Kabbalat Shabbat. You say something? No. Um, Kabbalat Shabbat was started literally here. The Livnot campus is sitting on a street named after Rabbi Shlomo El Kabetz, the author of this beautiful song, Al Chadadi, that everybody knows, the song that compares um, that moment that Shabbat enters the world, the moment of transition to Shabbat, to a big cosmic wedding between us and the Creator. Um, so the Kabbalists of Tzfat were super connected to nature. This is where they, they went to get a lot of their inspiration out in nature. And every Friday they used to go out to the field trees just around the corner from our campus. And they used to wear all white, like brides. And they used to turn to the West. And they used to meditate their way into Shabbat by singing beautiful songs as I said, all have to do with this idea of love and yearning and uniting. Um, and these are all the songs that you know, Lechadudi, Yedid Nefesh. So this whole concept of Kabbalah Shabbat was uh, started, um, started here, Shulchan Aruch, the writings of the Ari. This is why it's so um, exciting to find a site from the 16th century. And that's exactly what we found here. So Shai, may you be so kind to lead us downstairs into the alleyway, Simtat El Kabitz, into the Livnot Visiting Center, which is right here. So this is also surface level. Okay. And now, we're going to start going deeper. Excuse me, is there any way that you can make the picture bigger so that it's the full uh, width of the page? Okay, so let's stop for one moment. Shai, can you do that? There we go. Wow. Okay. So as we're no, going down. I guess you lose the uh, focus a little bit by doing that. Right. Are you, are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. Yes, thank you. This is a lot better. So, Shai, as you're gonna turn the camera and we're gonna start going down, I wanna tell you a, a Jewish uh, story. Um, so once upon a time, there was a guy named Moishele and he was a very, very poor guy. And uh, one night he started to have this dream that ended up being a repetitive dream that if he only is going to go to the big city, to Warsha, there is um, a palace there and there is um, a bridge. And if, because if he's going to dig beneath the bridge, he's going to find a treasure. And the story repeats itself. And he's like, I guess I have nothing to lose. And he takes his horse and his wagon and he goes there. And what do you know? He sees the palace, he sees the bridge. He's like, oh my God, maybe this was a real dream. He waits all the night and he starts to dig in a place where he believes there is treasure. But as he's starting to dig, he feels a very big hand on his shoulder. And one of the guards catches him and says to him, hey, who are you? What are you doing here in the middle of the night? And he's like, shh, listen there's a treasure here. Just let me dig and we're going to split it half and half. And the guy is like, what makes you believe that there's a treasure here? And he says, well, to be really honest, I had a dream. I had a dream there was a treasure here. And the guy is like, you got to be kidding me. Like, no, you are here digging in the middle of the night because of, the, of a dream. 
this is pathetic you know what me myself i had a dream the other night that there's this jewish guy named moishele and this jewish shtetl and under his oven in this kitchen if i'm gonna dig i'm gonna find a treasure do you think i'm gonna now leave everything i own and do and go find this moishele guy come on get out of here and he kicks him out and then the end of the story of course moishele goes back home he digs beneath the oven and he finds the treasure and this is a very deep story about how um, our treasures, or often they're so close, you know, they're like right here inside of us. But sometimes it takes a whole journey to, to go out and uh, so we can access those inner treasures. The reason I tell you the story is this, is because this is exactly what happened for us at Leave Not Leave Not. Can you imagine for 20 years, Leave Not have been doing archeology, span I'll swear, okay? All over Israel, Jerusalem, the, the Kotel tunnels, the ancient synagogues all over the Galilee, all over Tzfat. The one place where we never thought to dig is where? Right beneath our campus. Shai, can you like go back like two meters? I wanted to see how close was the office to the... Um, See, here's the office, okay? This is where people were working for 20 years and then show them the floor again. The floor was just closed and there was no opening there, okay? Here, this, there was nothing here, okay? But one day, um, a combination of wanting to expand the campus and like, I guess, a few hints that's kind of like... Um, suggested that maybe there's something there beyond what our eyes can see or in surface level, made Aaron and uh, Leave Not uh, staff um, decide to dig a little deeper. This was actually my first day after Leave Not. I came my first day of doing national service before saying hello. I got uh, gloves and a bucket and a sh shovel <laughs> and with, with all the staff, we were like, you know, on all fours digging. And here you go. This entire underground city was found right beneath our campus. Okay, so let's go a little deeper and see what we have found here. That's a perfect sound. Okay. Okay, so here's the first room. This is the room of um, we, where we thank uh, the people that made the digging possible, uh, people that pawed their energy and their love and their money uh, to make the digging possible. So I, I don't think you can see this, but every donor has a precious stone near his name. And that is because one of the Kabbalists, of the, the leader of the, of the Hasids, Rabbi Avraham Dov from Avrich that lived in Tzfat. Um, he fasted and he, he, he prayed a lot because he heard that Tzfat is so holy that the stones of Tzfat, they shine like precious stones. And he really wanted to, to have the merit and to be able to see that. So after a few weeks of hard work, he was able to see it. And uh, here at Livnot, we always say that to see that stones shine like diamonds, maybe that's like work for, you know, that's very advanced. But to realize that my spouse and my kids and my friends um, are shining like precious stones, that is something that people like us can, can work on. So every person got a little precious stone. We're going to continue. Um, Actually, this whole site is going to be look, it's going to look very differently in the, the, the coming. Uh, why, why don't you let me add something? You're going to add something? Since, okay. So, since you mentioned. Since uh, I mentioned. So, so uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about the plan about that we're doing it. But, uh, Go okay, ahead. But, but the precious stones were moving to another place. So because we're going to put in all donors. Until now, it's only been alumni. Who give a certain amount, but now we're going to open it up 
to all donors we're going to we didn't figure out how we're going to do it exactly because we want to use the the breastplate uh, the the high priest breastplate all the different stones on it because Tzfat 2000 years ago was one of the places that the priests uh settled two families of priests settled in Tzfat and that's probably one of the reasons that Tzfat became the spiritual center is not only because the Kabbalists were here but because this was a priestly city Okay. Right. So, it, it it was also a uh, Ir Miklat, uh, a re refuge city. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, in the past, uh, and and um, we have a, a lot of plans. We want people to be able. I don't know. He says that when we go, that, that the visiting center of Tzfat shouldn't be like a visiting center all over the world. People should go through a spiritual experience when they go down these tunnels. So we are now actually working on. Um, our visitors being able to uh, uh, meet the Kabbalists of the 16th century um, with uh, different uh, technological tricks that are gonna make that possible. So we have um, four figures that people are gonna be able to meet, Hariya Kadosh, Rabbi Yosef Karo, Sara Francisca, which was a, a female Kabbalist, and Rabbi Shlomo. Rabbi Yosef Karo, I said. And, and Rabbi Shlomo Kabitz. So people are going to be able to go move through the elements and 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 hear and see and meet these people. So you're going to have to come to Tzfat and see this in action. But anyway, uh, Shai, let's move on. And I want them to see in the in this room. Okay, first of all, you can kind of see, I, I don't know if you can see that, but in the ceiling, we can see two periods of time which means, so I didn't actually tackle the, the biggest question, how did all of this became underground? How and when and why, right? So since the 16th century, uh, Tzfad knew a lot of hardships, okay? There were three big earthquakes here. At 1837, there was a big earthquake that really destroyed the city completely. Um, the houses of Tzfat, Tzfat is built, built like a mountain, and the houses just fell on top of each other like domino. Um, Rabbi Avram uh, Dov from Average actually got famous for predicting the earthquake, but just in a few minutes. So he managed to save uh, a small amount of the community, whoever heard, he was just like screaming, and, and he got them all to his synagogue. And the part where there was the dome that they were standing beneath did not collapse, but even the outer walls of the same synagogue, just like the entire Tzfat collapsed. Um, uh, there were plagues in Tzfat, there was war, there was hunger. Okay, during World War I, um, people in, in Tzfat literally starved to death. They were so dependent on, on things coming from out of Israel. Anyway, Tzfat was ruined and 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 then and was rebuilt time after time. And this is why wherever you dig in Tzfat, you have a very good chance of finding history. And right here in this room, um, you can see in the ceiling where for sure a part of this room collapsed, but the locals made a decision to stay and fix it. And then they 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 rebuild the wall. So you can you can see the two periods of time on the wall itself. I don't know if you can really see what I'm talking about from this angle. Uh, but maybe when now uh, you can uh, make it over. Anyway, so that that's interesting. And now Shai, can you uh, spin the camera? And I want them to see the little mikvah. Here it is. Okay, we also uh, they created a children's tunnel there. So when the adults talk about uh, the meaning of life, the kids can crawl through that tunnel. But there's a, a, a little mikvah there. Some people that were digging here um, uh, really believe it's a mikvah. Other says that it's a little too small. But very soon, we're going to go down and you're going to see another mikvah where there is no doubt that it was a mikvah. So we're going to continue and we're going to go down. Okay, so all of these rooms were completely, completely filled with dirt all the way up to the ceiling. What you see is 100% authentic 
Okay, here we are going one more platform down. Just a little bit of information, Rabbi Yosef Karo. Mosaic is, uh, is new, that's uh, a little addition that we added there. Okay, let's take a look. It's, uh, I, I can't really tell you for sure, for sure what these rooms were used for. They might've been storage places. They might've been sleeping rooms. They might've been stores. It's kind of hard to know, but very soon in the tour, we're gonna to get to the part where we know exactly what everything was. See, there's all these like hiding places. Okay, and uh, Shai, maybe reverse just uh, 10 seconds exactly, that's good. Okay, you see the, the weapons on the wall. Um, this, this space comes to commemorate the, the very big miracle that took place in Sfat in the War of Independence. This was a story that happened just a few days before Ben Gurion declared the Jewish state. And it's a very long story. Maybe I'll, I'll just like say a, a, few, a few points. If you go back enough, there was actually um, such beautiful neighborhood, um, neighborship uh, between the Jews, the, the Jewish community and the Arab community that was living in Tzfat, that were living in Tzfat, the, the kids were playing together. Um, the adults were working together. There was a lot of trust. Um, but unfortunately, that did not stay the case, um, you know, with, with, with Zionism and, and, and tension building up um, until it kind of all explode in Me'oraot Tarpat. The, the very surprising massacre that took place in 1929, where um, Arabs came to the Jewish section and people were murdered and it was very, very surprising. It was very, very brutal. The British people didn't do anything to defend the Tzfadis um, and, and the whole Jewish uh, uh, quarter was, was uh, robbed and was uh, on fire basically. Now, the one maybe positive thing that came out of this awful event is that the Jews started to understand that they have to learn to protect, to defend themselves, okay? Because we're talking about what we call Heshuvah Yesha. We're talking about people that used to do nothing but, but learning Torah and pray. They had no idea how to use a gun. But after that event, they realized that it's probably just a matter of time till an event like this is going to happen once again. And indeed, um, 20 years later, when the British people um, were leave, living, leaving um, Israel, every place they left uh, started a war. And in Tzfat, the Jewish uh, section was a minority. There were 1,200 Jews that were living in Tzfat. There were 15,000 Arabs. And it was very, very obvious that once the British people are gonna be out of here, no one is gonna be here to protect uh, the Jews and the war is gonna start. And the British people told the Jews, guys, within half an hour, now one Jewish person is gonna, is gonna remain alive in Tzfat. Okay, remember what happened 20 years ago? Like this time, no one is gonna stay alive. So when we're leaving the British, you're leaving too. And on the day that they left, they brought uh, bulletproof vehicles and they told the Tzfatis, okay, come on guys, this is it. Say goodbye to Tzfat. Um, and, and, you know, there were Arab troops from four different Arab countries around us on their way here. Um, soldiers with, well, they had a lot of weapons. The Jewish Tzfat was under a siege. Really, the Tzfadis had no chance at all. But they did, uh, they decided to, to take a very, very uh, unexpected and, and weird, maybe it, it probably seemed a suicidal to the British people. They decided they're not going on those bulletproof vehicles and they're staying in Tzfat and they're gonna, maybe for the first time in 2000 years, um, they're gonna defend themselves, okay? They're gonna defend and they're gonna try to push off the fire and, and they're gonna try to, to fight back. And the British people literally begged them, guys, you're insane. You know what? At least send away the women and the children, the babies. Like, 
can you imagine what's going to happen here when we're going to leave? And the Tzadik were like, not this time. Not this time. We, we did that for 2,000 years. This time, we're going to defend our lives and we're going to defend our holy city, Tzfat. And those bulletproof vehicles, uh, they left empty. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy story. 35 Palmach warriors made it into Tzfat the night before when they came in. And the feeling was as if Messiah came in. And, you know, in uh, just two weeks, we're going to celebrate Purim. The very important Hebrew word, a key word to understand the story of Purim is v'nahafochu. Okay, you guys know this word in Hebrew? V'nahafochu means, and it flipped. Everything flipped. Okay, that's exactly what happened here in Tzfat, where 300 warriors, maybe, maybe 300 people that can hold the gun, uh, that were fighting against tens of thousands of people um uh and they won <laughs> they won i can't really explain how that happened but we uh, had the davidka nahon, nahon. so there's stories about the davidka that the davidka is a, is, a, is a pathetic weapon that only holocaust survivors can can use because it's so stupid and unuseful but it makes a ton of noise and um in a really good timing when they were using the davidka very heavy rain started to come down and it was kind of out of season because in May it doesn't usually rain in Israel. If it does rain, it's not so hard rain. But this rain was, you know, with lightning and thunder and like was, everybody was very confused. It created a very apocalyptic feeling um, and that ended up with, with the, the, the Arabs ran away from Tzfat. And the Jews woke up to this new reality where, A, they're alive, where, which they really did not even see that part coming. Um, but but Tzfat, they made Tzfat into Jewish Tzfat. And if, if they were to go on, this, on those buses, today Tzfat would, would, would have been the south of Lebanon. Tzfat would have not been a part. Tzfat in the whole Galilee, the whole upper Galilee would have not been a part of the Jewish state, which is so crucial for being able to defend our tiny little country. Yeah? Okay, whoa, just 10 minutes, ah, okay. So anyway, the form of Tzfat, uh, this is why these guns are on these walls and we're gonna go down, further down. The next thing we're gonna see are ancient water cisterns. Oh wait, I think they, you skipped one water cistern. Go back, here it is. Okay, see this? These are ancient water cisterns. Basically, that's before having running water in Tzfat, the locals used to um, have these huge cisterns and they used to fill them up from rainwater and they used to live off these cisterns, okay? We made an axis so you can see the cisterns, but originally only a bucket would come uh, into these cisterns. So now we're gonna see three cisterns on one after the other. This is the first one. Okay, and we're going further down. Right here, there's another cistern. You can't really see it because we didn't fill it up with water, but we're like in the cistern right now. And we're gonna go down and see the third one. Here is another water cistern. We found eight water cisterns in this site. And I'm going to just let you. Yeah, we, we, we made a path. We connected the, the, the three cisterns. Once again, so you can see them. Because if not, they would, would have just stayed on the ground. And no one would know they existed. And we are about to come out. Now people are sometimes are surprised. How come we went so much down and yet we come out surface level? And that is because Tzfat is a mountain. <laughs> so we like hiked it from the inside, hiked it down from the inside. And we are now entering the second part that is called Beit HaKahal. 
Okay. Let me see if the camera is going to pause on the before picture of this site. Yeah, there was crazy wind like uh, two nights ago. <laughs> it's teared a lot of the signs and spots, including ours. Um, but anyway, I'm going to just describe to you what you would, would see in this sign. This whole entire site was buried beneath a big mountain, okay? Like all of this, yeah, from where all of this exactly was underground. We were just sitting on this mountain, like playing music, not having any idea what's inside. We're gonna continue inside. And the next thing you're gonna see is a communal bathhouse where we found the ancient mikvah from the 16th century, golden era of Tzfat. Okay, there's different things that we found here, but since our time is so limited, I am gonna wait with the explanations till we see the mikvah. Okay, here we are. Beit Kahal. Lehit Kahel means to come together. It means it's a, it was a community community center. And here is the mikvah. Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly how it worked. First of all, Shai, can you point um, the volcanic rock up there on the top of the picture? See this volcanic rock? We found a whole pile of volcanic rock, which they're not native to Tzfat. Okay, they're not, they're, there are no volcanic rocks in Tzfat. So what are they doing here? So volcanic rocks, they know to observe a lot of heat. So the technique used to be, they used to take these rocks, they used to put them in the ovens that I'm going to show you in one minute. They used to take them out when they were so hot, pour water on them, and steam would come out. So then they can sit in a wet sauna, okay? But we're talking about a Jewish bathhouse, and it's not enough to just be clean, right? They want to be pure. And this is why we have the mikvah here. Now, there's a special... Um, there's a special story. They, they, there is a, um, a letter that was written by the mom, the ima of the Ariya Kadosh, the Holy Ari, the, the biggest Kabbalist of the 16th century, the one that made Tzfat into Tzfat. And in this letter, she uh, refers to Rabbi Chaim Vital, the greatest student of the Ari, and she says to him, I'm very concerned about you guys jumping into freezing springs to mikvah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about my health of my son. Please promise me that you only go in heated and warmed uh, mikvah, which is always makes me smile because, you know, you can be Neo from the matrix. And yet when you leave the house, your mom is like, don't forget to take a sweater. It's cold outside, right? Like we're talking about the biggest Kabbalist in the history of the last 2000 years with the Jewish people. He still has a mom that wants to make sure that her son won't be cold, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is that I can't promise you that the Ariya Kadosh used this mikvah as his mikvah, but I can definitely, I can't promise you that he did not. And Maybe, I mean, if he wanted to uh, do kibudurim and to do what his mom asked and he wanted a heated mikvah, so here is a heated mikvah from the 16th century. So there's a very good chance that all those great masters, Rabbi Yosef Karo and Ari and all of those great, great, great teachers of ours, perhaps this was the mikvah that they were using. Now they knew how to, as I said, they knew how to heat up the mikvah. And this is what I want to show you now. Okay, here is the biggest room. Okay, now can you imagine when they, when they were digging this room, they had to crawl, like there was this much space between the ceiling and, and the dirt. Like it was filled with dirt all the way to the top. 
And Shainai fo focused the camera on the communal oven, okay? So just like people didn't use to own showers and they would have to come to the communal bathhouse to bathe, same thing with the ovens. People didn't used to own ovens in their private houses and they would have to come and use one of these communal ovens. So we found the communal ovens and um, this is what is making this site to the, the JCC of the 16th century, okay? Like this is where Jews would come to bathe, to chat, to talk, to make food, to braid challah. And especially the big scene was around Shabbat when every Friday on the way to, to, to shul, um, everybody would come with their with their chulen pots, okay, chulens or chamin, and they would put the pot and the communal oven near the pots of all their neighbors, okay? And then the next day, they would come here after, after uh, uh, praying, after davening was done, and they used to greet each other with Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom Rabbi Yosef Karol, Shabbat Shalom Rabbi Shalom Kabetz, and every family would take their pot back home. So you can see why it was so exciting to find this site again like people buy houses in Sfat and they dig and they found they they find ancient rooms beneath their houses all the time happens all the time but to found the fact that we found like what was the heart of the Jewish community in the 16th century that was like super exciting and it really felt like like a kiss from Shemai you know like we, we call ourselves, I will name his, the organization, to build and to be built, right? And here we are, like sitting on this incredible site from the 16th century. So you see that it's not random that the mikveh is uh, sitting on top of the oven, okay? Shai, can you continue with the camera? Maybe they're going to see the other oven. And this oven is a working oven these days. We're like, hey, let's let's make it work. So we, we connected it to gas and birthright groups come and by mitzvah girls come and we make challah for Shabbat uh, or pitas or whatever. And we, we bake it in the original oven, which is super cool. Okay, we're gonna continue down so you can see the entire site because beneath that big room, there is another water cistern here's another beautiful room that was found uh, during holidays and vacations we we have different uh, happenings of uh, ancient um, uh, crafts so we do pottery and mandalas and um, basket weaving and different different things and music okay here we are in the last platform this is the last water cistern that we found so deep into the ground and maybe this is a good chance to i know we're we're about to end and uh i want to i want to also take some questions there is something so spotty there's a very spotty message i feel um visiting this site okay because what is kabbalah anyway right like how is the way that the kabbalists see the world special or different from the way that normal people see the world so the word kabbalah comes from the word hakbalah hakbalah means parallel and the kabbalists always said that our world is basically it's parallel to um other spiritual dimensions and what does that mean? It means that they always believe that if you're going to look at the world, if you're going to look at yourself and you're going to look at a situation or a friend, just with like surface level eyes, you definitely won't see, you won't get the whole story. Okay. Our world is made out of dimensions. And the Ari claimed that even rocks even stones they seem so steady right like there's no motion in rocks there's definitely no life no consciousness in a rock yes 
<laughs> um, I always thought it would be really interesting to have the Ariya Kadosh meet with a modern uh, quantum, quantum physics um, scientist. I, I'm sure they would have a lot to talk about because the Ari, um, you know, 500 years ago already said, guys, there is motion even in matter, okay? There are godly sparks. There is consciousness. There's a very famous story of Rabbi Akiva looking at the ashes of the destroyed temple and he's starting to laugh. And people thought, okay, he lost it. He saw so much people died in war that he just lost it. And they're like, Rabbi, why are you laughing? He's like, what do you mean, why am I laughing? Now that I see that the prophets were right, they said, if we're not going to fix our actions, this is exactly what's going to happen. But the same prophets, the same mouth that predicted this destruction, or the same mouth that predicted this destruction is not going to be forever. This building was ruined to one day build another one. One day, humanity is going to figure it out. And we're going to mature and we're going to uplift consciousness and we're going to unite and there's going to be a beautiful world. So his ability was to look beyond surface level, beyond what his eyes is showing him and to see way deeper, right? Way deeper to see eternity. And I guess um, another name that we have for the Kabbalistic teachings is Pnimiuta Torah. Pnimiuta Torah means the inner teachings of the Torah. And people learn these inner teachings to develop an inner way of looking at the world and remembering <coughs> never do I get uh, the whole story in my first sight. I can always dig deeper and deeper into myself, deeper and deeper into my spouse, deeper and deeper into a friend or a situation. And I'm going to um, discover um, treasures you know that that were I, I i didn't see on on the first look so i just think it's so spotty that like all of this was right there but if we were to stay at surface level till this, this very day we we would we knew we would know nothing about it right it's just because we were digging a little deeper that this entire place was found um with all those beautiful secrets um People ask a question. Yes. Okay. So now question. Yeah. I can't see. Can you see? Can you? Okay. Let me just add one thing, uh, if I can. Uh, just uh, I, I don't think you have mentioned that the Kahal was declared a national heritage site uh, ten years ago by the Knesset, and and uh, they paid for a plan architect's plan and a general plan for the whole place. And we're supposed to have 200,000 people a year. And that's a pretty amazing thing. And for many of the people that we have, and we already do, like we have every day already uh, uh, groups coming, especially birthright groups coming for like hour long workshops. And for many, most, almost all, this is their, their encounter with spirituality. And uh, we do all kinds of things to try to make it a spiritual experience, whatever that means. But that's what Svat's all about is spirituality. As I think everybody knows, leave note for the last five years has been the official birthright extension, spiritual extension. And uh, this is what we're building and we're gonna continue. So questions, any questions? Any questions? or anything people want to share? Well, everybody is welcome to come back, come back and visit. I mean, everyone was here, whether it was 35 years ago in the program or um, um, visit. Here, and, he, he wants yeah. to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, when I was there, I don't know, like 100 years ago when I met Aaron, uh, you told me to, to go to Hameiri when uh, I think it, the name is Hameiri, the, yeah. the people Hameiri. Museum, yeah. The museum, and it was very interesting. I think uh, it's worth going. Anybody that's going to be there, it, it would be worth going. There is a lot of history in there that I learned 
uh, from from him what they did during the the war and what uh, um, you know all the all the things that um, that happened like with the the telegram that came in that the Palmach was sending Aleph Bet, which meant between the people at the Palmach Anubaim and uh, what do you call it? the Arabs uh, when they saw Aleph Bet they thought atom bomba that it was a, 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 a nuclear weapon that's going to be coming in. And then the, the Davidka came, uh, happened. So that, that's the, there is a lot of stories in there that are unbelievable. At the time I saw, I spoke to the guy that was there during uh, Milchemet Ashikudu and the, uh, the War of Independence. I don't know if he's still around. No, no, he passed away. Passed away. He was 14 years old in the War for Independence. Right. He was a runner. <laughs> yeah, and the, the the story that he told us when we were there was that uh, um, he had the Arab people that he knew, like Arab friend, <laughs> friends, let's call them friends, um, and they told them, you know, the you really you should leave because we really feel sorry for you that uh, they're going to all massacre you, and he answered to them without, you know, like. As, as you're having a, a small conversation and he said to the to his friend he said well you don't know what's coming here you can i suggest that you and your family and everybody just go because what's going to come here is going to be something that you guys have not never seen and there were a whole bunch of arabs that left so his his stand at the time i think he did something he must have done something so it's a very interesting uh, thing to go to that uh, to that museum. Just wanted to to say that. Thank so, you. Hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 Uh, well, this was just fascinating. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm a little bit um, uncertain about this. So this area, this huge area, is from the 16th century. Right. And then there was the earthquake in 1837 that somehow filled it in. Is that what happened? No. Oh. <laughs> That's, it's a very good question that you asked. Um, the answer, as far as I could tell, is, um, you know, what, one thing that uh, Yifat didn't say, she, a lot she, she, you know, Yifat was terrific. But one very important point is in 1900, there are something like, uh, um, something like 9,000 Jews in Sfat and 2,000 Arabs. And then in 1948, as she said, there are 12, 15,000 Arabs and 1,200 Jews. So what happened to all the Jews? Well, most of them, as she said, World War I was a disaster in that, that because most of the Jews lived off of uh, Chalukah, off of money from Europe. And because of the war, World War I, no money can come in. People starve to death and the typhus. And really most of the Jews at Sfat either died or whoever could get out left. But one thing about the houses at Sfat that are built out of stone and dirt and stone and dirt, when they're not taken care of and lived in, uh, they eventually, a stone falls and another stone falls out and then the whole fa house falls down. And we have uh, uh, the, the ministry, uh, the um, Antiquities Authority did a book on, on the Kahal, a, uh, this is a site of, uh, of Israel. And they did this a book and they had a, 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 um, a photo from a German airplane from 1918, you know, remember the German, the the Germans were uh, uh, were with the Turks, and uh, who ruled here, and they had a, a picture of the Kahal of the area with houses on it, and so at the beginning of the century there were houses, not all houses. There is also some ruins, but then there were houses. The 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 earthquakes destroyed, but I believe that that most of what they destroyed was restored because on the whole, you can't leave bodies underground. 
And you also can't really build on, on a building that was destroyed. It's just always gonna be unstable. So they had to rebuild them. And so, so if that's an answer to your question, probably most of the Kahal um, was lived in after the earthquake was restored. And then it just got buried under because um, over the years it was empty. And then when people would, re uh, would uh, restore their own houses, they just dumped the, the debris into their neighbor. And we were the neighbor of everyone. So, so how did you know? When did you begin to suspect? You know, Ilana, when you were in the program yeah. in, uh, in, 82. in 1980, what? 82. 82. No, 1982, 40 years ago you were here. Uh -huh. Do you remember what you did? Do you remember what work project you did? Oh, you dug out a house. Everything. <laughs> yeah, you dug out a house that was a ruin. Uh, at, at the time, I mean, it worked for someone, it was for a private person. Yes. Uh, we stopped doing for private people very quickly. We only did pu public projects. Oh. But, um, you know, we have a lot of experience of digging out uh, uh, that house that you dug out is a beautiful house now. And, uh, you know, when, when we, when Leave Note was established, when I bought my house, and, and Leave Note bought its property, which was 30 years ago. No one wanted anything in Sfat. No one wanted to live here. The, it was only old people who couldn't walk the stairs anymore. Their kids didn't want to live here. And, uh, and, and everybody had a treasure under their house. And, mm -hmm. we're, and we dug it out. And uh, we're very fortunate. We're very fortunate not just to have found the, the kahal, but you know the fact that Tzfat is the spiritual capital of the Jewish world, and we're in the middle of it, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very fortunate. We intend to, to make something that that every Jew and also non-Jew, by the way, will have a spiritual experience, and that's what we're working on right now. Come here, then we have a company that by the first of August they're supposed to finish the plan. Let's see if it's up. And yeah, okay. Any more questions? Any other questions or comments? Okay, so it was really nice to see you all. It won't be completed till I see you all here. And uh, uh, anybody who wants to stay on and say a few words, I'd it's love to, to hear from you. Uh, you know, Andrea, I saw you not so long ago. Victor, you haven't been here for about six, seven years. Yep. Bob, we, uh, you know, we speak every once in a while. Uh, Guy Lieberman was with my son the other day. Right, Guy? Uh, is my dad. Different uh, guy. Oh, that's you. I thought it was Lauren. Oh, it's Lauren. I thought there's someone else, a Guy Lieberman. Hi, Lauren. So I don't, uh, we don't, uh, who else is on the screen? How do we find on the screen? Uh, Nicole was many, many years ago. Aaron Schwartz, we talked. Who's Esther Afric? Can we see you? Can I see who you are? Esther? Hi. Wait, so, so help me out. Who are you? You're, you're muted. Yeah, un unmute yourself. You're muted. You're muted. Okay. Hi. 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 Master Afrik is my mom. Hi. And I'm Afrik. I was in Shari Bina in, in 99. <laughs> in Shari Bina. Yeah. Did you ever come by then? I did. We had some Shabbatons there and some Motzei Shabbos events. I don't remember there being tunnels. Was, no, was the, the tunnels, tunnels weren't there? there night. The it tunnels wasn't weren't there. there. The tunnels weren't there. I mean, they were there, but there was. Um, we didn't uncover it till about twenty years ago. Uh, we purchased it in 1990, but uh, we didn't really do a lot of work in it. Oh, so it first started to be dug out like in 2003 or something? Well, it's around, uh, I don't remember exactly. 2000. 2000. Around 2000, we started digging out. 
Oh, so just when I was there, you were just yeah, stopped. Yeah, we, we, we're far from finished. I mean, we <laughs> have we have another five or six uh, water cisterns. And uh, wait, I have to get a cord. One second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the computer is going to die. It died? No, Alan's getting it. Huh? Thank you so much. We really enjoyed this. Pleasure. So happy you could join us. I enjoyed it very much too. Um, and I'm, I'm going to make sure that my uh, daughter, Julie, who was in the program, I don't know, must be 30 years ago, um, gets to see it because yeah, I know you're looking record. forward to seeing her. Yeah, um, no, I she'll she'll get to see the recording. I think they're out of town right now. So in any case, it was fascinating. Okay, well, we're looking for you to come back and visit us. And okay. hopefully next week, Michael's gonna come back and do a clip and uh, um, and enjoy everybody. Thank you for, for coming. Thanks again. What a stuff, everybody. Have a good Azal, uh, wonderful, happy Purim. And hopefully uh, we're praying for peace for the whole world and, and safety for our fellow Jews that are in the Ukraines and for all the humans there that are going through a lot of uh, pain. So we're, we're praying for better days. Bezrat Hashem, there should be a v'nahafochu and everything should flip for the better. A question, do you guys do uh, Purim or Susan Purim? No, that's a very good question. So, uh, so one of the arguments 500 years ago when the Spanish Jews came, uh, uh, when the Jews came from Spain, there was a community in Sfat of what's called Mustaravim, Jews who never left Israel. And Sfat had a large community, a couple hundred people who were um, called Mustaravim, who were like Arabic Jews. Uh, who spoke Arabic, dressed Arabic, and many of them claim their heritage that they never left Sfat. There's still a couple families that claim that they, they're here from the second, second temple period. And um, they actually had a, had a custom that Sfat was a walled city from the days of uh, Yoshua ben Nun, meaning to celebrate Shushan Purim. And this is also what the Arit said. So, so yeah, well, well, the thing is, is they had a an argument with the span the new Olim from Spain. This is 500 years ago, and in the end, the uh, Yosef Caro, who was the chief rabbi at Sfat, decided in their favor that uh, that because they had the custom of the uh, minhagavot. Uh, so it was decided that Sfat is, was a walled city, uh, although now it's, it's still bisafek, it's a doubtful, so usually a lot of people do celebrate Purim on, on uh, the regular Purim, and then they have uh, celebrate like half of a second Purim. Uh, it's like just an like opportunity. We do, we do yeah. the mitzvot in, the, in Shushan. We hear the Megillah again. We give the Mishlech Haimanot again. Usually the big festival is in the first day of Purim. But we do everything again on Shushan. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, for, thank you for sticking it out with the quality of the sound and making okay. it all work. It was oh, fine thank in the end. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Good evening. Good morning. Good evening here. Good evening. <laughs> Good morning.